Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy
Welcome to Church Online. My name is Emmanuel Robinson, and I serve as a Connections Pastor here at the Capitol Church. Thank you so much for joining us for Church Online. We as a church have been praying specifically for you and want you to know that throughout this entire stream, you can click on the live prayer request button if you're on Church Online, and one of our team members will be right with you. If you're on Facebook or even YouTube, go ahead and put a prayer request in the comment section, and we will love to pray specifically for you. Well, today we have a very special message from Pastor Ryan called Faith on a Mission. So right now, if you know of anybody who needs a jumpstart in their faith, go ahead and invite them to this stream. You have a couple of minutes to invite them to join us. And by doing that, you are helping to spread the gospel to every single person that we know. And so right now, we're going to go into a time of worship with Pastor Robbie. So as he leads us into two songs, let's go ahead and get our family together, open up our heart to experience God today through Church Online.
reverence you in this moment. We reverence you in this moment. And all I am is yours. What a special moment in the presence of God. God is right there where you are. He's meeting with you and your family right now. Wow, I'm so thankful that God meets with us exactly where we are. If you're thankful for that, if you're thankful for God's presence, go ahead right now in the comment section, in the chat, go ahead and type how thankful you are for the presence of God, how thankful you are for His grace, for His healing power, for His mercy in your life. See, we cannot wait until we meet again in person, but until then, this is one of the main ways that we are connecting with each other. One of the other ways that you can get connected is by joining a virtual small group. These are small groups that meet on platforms like Zoom and even Skype by still maintaining what we all need in our life, and that is community. So go ahead, if you are not a part of a small group, you can click on the small group tab on the top right hand side of your screen, or you can go to our website at thecapitalchurch.org slash groups to sign up for a small group, and I will personally reach out to you and connect you to a group. If you would like to give to support the ministry of the Capital Church of what God is doing here, you can go to our website at thecapitalchurch.org slash give, or you can click on the Give Now tab on the top right-hand side of your screen. See, your sacrificial giving has made an impact right here in our city. Ever since this whole pandemic started, our food pantry has served well over 4,000 people right here in our community since the beginning of the year. Our food pantry team puts well over 500 hours in a month. Because of your sacrificial giving, we have also been able to support ministries around the entire world to spread the gospel. Now before we go into a message from Pastor Ryan titled, Faith on a Mission, check out this video from a ministry that we support right there in Bethlehem. But he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said, We have no more but five loaves and two fishes. With our five loaves and two fishes, we could reach 100 families. I was very happy to feel that I'm showing them Jesus Christ and not preaching only. This is the time when the church is go out to reach in the society and put its input to show Jesus. A sentence, I like it. If the life is not good, but God is good. Nowadays, we're facing a disaster, the coronavirus, but I think there is a positive side in this, that we can help people and show that the Lord is good and uh, he can protect them and help them in bad circumstances. I think uh, the, this ministry can uh, let all of the people know that Jesus came to this life to give, to give them strength to cope with, with these situations. I think such a blessing that as a members we share in this ministry. I would like to thank everyone that he helps us in this ministry, even in a small thing. محبه المسيح مش مقتصر على الكنائس مش مقتصر انك تكون عضو في كنيسة او تكون مشارك في اجتماعات وصلوات المحبة المسيحي انك انت تخرج للناس وانك انت تكون عضو فعال في المجتمع وتكون هذه الخدمة انك إن هي تكون هدفها الاساسي انها God, we could do this ministry. Our goal is to put our love to this society. Uh, we pray that God touch this ministry, increase this ministry, show the love of Jesus to all people in our country. Hello, Capital Church family. Thank you so much for joining us on this stream. Hey, why don't you take a moment right now to go ahead and invite some of your friends or family 
to join with you for this live stream to hear what the Lord would have to say to us as a community together. You could send them a text. You could invite them to a virtual watch party. It's time when we can be together virtually, and I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll share and like and subscribe to the social media feeds so that the message about Jesus can spread to everybody we know. Thank you so much for doing that. So excited about what God is doing during a very difficult and challenging time for many of us. Listen, I want you to know that we're aware that a lot of people are struggling right now. A lot of people are suffering. A lot of people have difficulty financially and difficulty with their health. And and, uh, we just want you to know we are praying for you as a community. We're praying for you in your job. We're praying for you in the sources of income and the streams of resources God flows into your life. And we want you to know that we believe God is going to provide for all of us together. God's going to heal all of us together. And we are grateful for that. We're grateful for you that you're joining with us today. So thank you so much for doing that. And and we want you to remember that uh, we made you aware this week in an email, but I want to remind you that We as a church want to help and bless those who are in need. So because of some generous contributions of several people within our church family, we have funds to be able to help and bless people who are in need. So if you know of someone who has a particular acute need as a result of this circumstance, we want you to communicate that to us. You can let me know. You can, uh, you can send an email to Ryan at the capital uh, You can let one of our other staff members know or, or one of the board members, and we will be glad to, 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 to pray about that and, and to seek the Lord about how we can help those needs together. We want to bless you. We want to bless this community. God has blessed us, and we want to be blessings to others. So we hope you'll take part in that. Remember, our food pantry is also up and running people are being served there by the hundreds. So we we pray that you would continue to lift them up in prayer for their safety and their provision and all of those things that go into that ministry. Thank you so much for taking part. We believe God's going to use those things to advance His cause in the world where we are today. I want to continue to talk in this particular uh, time together about the life of Peter and about what we learned from his life and his encounters with Jesus. And so I want to talk today about faith with a mission, and we're going to look at the life of Peter and see uh, what goes on with faith with a mission. I want to go to the Lord in prayer right now and ask His blessings on this portion of our time together. Can you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank You for Your goodness. We thank You, Lord, for Your mercy. We thank You that You are with us. We thank You, Lord, that You are our healer. You are our provider. You are our protector. You are our strength. You are our joy. You are our shield. You are our very great reward. And we trust you, Lord. We love you. We serve you. We worship you together. Though we can't be here physically, all over this community, we lift you up now. Wherever we are, wherever we're watching this stream, we just lift you up together and we worship you now in Jesus' strong name. And everybody said aloud, Amen. And amen, and amen. Well, turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, and you're hearing in just a moment. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. If you've ever felt like your faith was weak or flailing, you are in good company. Even one of the greatest heroes of early Christianity, the apostle Peter, had colossal wins and cataclysmic losses with regard to his own personal faith journey. Today I want us together to take a look at one of those times Peter got it right and see what we can learn about Jesus' mission and about how he wants to use us in it. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, hear the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, 
but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Now, this passage tells us that Jesus and his disciples are on, a, on their way to a place called Caesarea Philippi. That, that location was about 25 miles to the north of the Sea of Galilee, far away from the spiritual capital of the Jewish people, the city of Jerusalem. It would have been an out-of-the-way trip for the disciples. They might have wondered on their way from Galilee up to the, the boonies, what, on the, what in the world are we doing? This is so off the beaten path. Why are we going so out of the way? In fact, if you've ever been to the Holy Land, it's actually unlikely that, that uh, you've ever even been up there because most trips to the Holy Land don't even take the time to, to make that effort to go up to that part of the country. There's a cave there at the base of Mount Hermon, uh, which is referred to many times in the Scripture uh, Mount Hermon, but there's a cave that is at the base of that mountain referred to in the Scripture, and that cave is believed to be an opening to the underworld in the first century. At the back of that cave, there's a, a deep ravine that, that, that splits the mountain rock and descends into the darkness and into the unknown, and the ancients believed that that chasm was a portal to the underworld. That area is known for two specific religious backgrounds. One is that it was the center of worship for a pagan god called Pan. Pan was the god whose chief tactic was to inspire fear. It was believed that the god named Pan won battles among the other deities by inspiring disorder and fear among his opponents. Very interesting that Jesus leads his disciples to this place that is the center of worship for a God of chaos and fear. In fact, the name Pan is uh, from that God is where we get the term panic or pandemic. And so that was a center of worship in that area. And Jesus leads his disciples there to have a little spiritual retreat with them. At the same time, uh, the Roman Emperor Augustus gave that area to Herod the Great, the Jewish king, who would, who would build a temple in that location uh, to the emperor, a temple right there, uh, right near that cave that was in honor of Pan. He would build a temple that would honor emperor, the emperor Augustus, and uh, he would honor the emperor Caesar near that cave. When uh, Herod died, that area was bequeathed to his son Philip, and Philip uh, renamed the whole entire area, he rebuilt the city and renamed the area Caesarea Philippi to continue to honor the emperor. At that time, the, the Roman Empire was known for the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome, and and they, they touted themselves as having brought peace to the world, and, and Caesar himself was viewed as a kind of prince of peace. In fact, they even called the Roman emperor the son of God, struck onto the coins that people carried around in currency every single day in the marketplace was an image of Caesar with the phrase son of God right over his head on those coins. He was known, he was referred to, he was worshipped, he was revered as the son of God. In fact, in many places and in many ways in the empire, people were sometimes even required to sacrifice to the emperor or at least sacrifice on his behalf in order to demonstrate loyalty to Rome and in order to be accepted into the social order of the day. So the area where Jesus took his disciples was a, a, a rich spiritual place. It was connected to these pagan uh, deities. It was connected to idolatrous worship. And Jesus took this several day journey to this out of the way place with one question on his mind. The question that he would ask his disciples that day, who do people say the Son of Man is? 
Now, the Son of Man is one of Jesus' favorite designations for himself. It's one of his favorite ways of talking about himself and referring to himself. That phrase is, is deep in biblical symbolism and meaning, and, and I don't have time to fully unpack it here, but, but it suffices to say it reminds us of three things. It reminds us that he came as a humble messenger, just the Son of Man, a, just another guy who came, and, and uh, another, a person, a person. Uh, he came in full humanity. He would, it also reminds us that as Isaiah prophesied, he would be a suffering servant. Just as all humanity has had its share of suffering, Jesus himself would know suffering and would know pain. But it also reminds us that he would be a glorious king, for in the prophecies of Daniel, the term son of man is definitely a divine title given to one who, who stands before the ancient of days. And so this term son of man is rich with all kinds of meaning. And Jesus says, who do people say that the son of man is? Who do people say that I am? Jesus was interested in how people perceived him. He was interested in what people thought about him. And the disciples, of course, replied in verse 14, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Some of them believed that Jesus was essentially one of the prophets who had who'd come, who'd returned from the dead to deliver a message of repentance and judgment from God. And so the question was asked, what kind of prophet will he be? Will he be like John the Baptist who called the people to repentance and to baptism? Would he be like Elijah who confronted the powers of the day? Or maybe he'd be like Jeremiah who, who foretold a coming judgment for sin. Or maybe, would Je maybe Jesus would bring something new and fresh. Maybe he'd be like a, a new Gideon who would take just a few men and defeat those Roman oppressors. Maybe he'd be like a, a new David who would defeat the powerful foreigners with no army and, and some unlikely weapons. They were hungry for something, anything that could bring change. Jesus would take that question, who do people say that I am? And he would turn it directly to his disciples. Not just out there, not, not just what's going on out there. What about you? Who do you say that I am? Now, I have to say here that our world has a lot of different ideas about Jesus. I mean, if you just ask the common person on the street... People have different ideas about who Jesus is and what he came to do. Uh, there was a time when most people would say that he was the son of God. There was a time when, in certainly this area, most people would even claim to have some kind of relationship with him. That's growing less and less likely. In fact, it's growing more and more likely that people would actually be hostile towards the faith. And Jesus turns to his disciples and said, I'm interested in what they think about me, but I'm also interested in what you think about me. And Peter, Peter, in, in one of his most glorious moments, responds instantly and without hesitation, one of his finest moments. The other disciples were too proud to risk getting it wrong and too uncertain to say what they suspected might be right. And Peter customarily just dove in head first. And that's exactly what he did here. And he says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Now the term Christ wasn't the last name of Jesus as if he had been born to Mr. and Mrs. Christ on uh, Bethlehem Lane or something. Christ itself was a loaded term in first century Judaism. It was a Greek translation of the Hebrew term Mashiach, or Messiah, and it literally means anointed one. And in the time of the first century, it had come to mean the anointed one, the special leader, the special servant who would do God's bidding and would be the one who would ultimately come as God's warrior king to deliver his people from all of their enemies. So Jesus is acknowledged by Peter to be the special chosen servant of God to do just that. But he doesn't stop there. He says, you're the son of the living God. David in the Old Testament had been referred to as a son of God. 
And so this kind of idea that, that Jesus was, a, was, a, was the Son of God was this tapping into this rich biblical theology that Jesus was a special son of David, greater than any of David's sons, greater than David himself, and have a, he would have a unique relationship with God. Very significant that Peter recognizes this, and all of this happens in this center for worshiping false gods. In this place where they, where they worshipped Pan, the god of chaos and fear, where they worshipped Caesar and, and acknowledged him as Lord of the cosmos or Savior of the universe or however they lifted up Caesar in those places, he says, you're the son of the living God. In other words, you're different from all of these other things that are worshipped out there. You're different from everything else that people say you are or that is going on in the world around us. How we receive Jesus, how we think about Jesus, how we perceive him makes all the difference in the world. Because that question that Jesus took his disciples on that retreat to Caesarea Philippi comes to us as well. Who do you say Jesus is? Sometimes I think Jesus calls us to out of the way places so he can sit with us and ask us some things. Not because he needs to find out, but because we need to find out. And what we say in response makes all the difference for how we live our lives. If we say Jesus is just a good example, we'll follow him only when it's convenient. If Jesus is just a good teacher, we'll believe him when we agree with him. If Jesus was just a sacrificial character, we'll pity him when we're moved by his suffering. If Jesus is just a savior, we'll call on him in those moments when we think we need saving. But if Jesus truly is the son of the living God, then he's much more than any of those things. If he truly is the son of the living God, then an encounter with Jesus will reorient everything in your life. The challenge there is you can't meet Jesus and continue to be the same person. You can't meet Jesus and continue to be the same husband or the same wife. You can't meet Jesus and continue to be the same person you were in your past. Because when we meet Jesus, when we truly meet the one who is the son of the living God, something transformational happens on the inside of us. And we are made new from the inside out, not made perfect but made new and made fresh. How in the world do we receive that? How, how, how do we encounter that? Well, Peter must have wondered the same thing. And, and Jesus, Jesus answers that question to him. He says, well, it's not by flesh and blood, Peter. It's not, it, it's, not the, it's not the natural way of knowing things that has revealed this to you, Peter, but this has been revealed to you by my Father who's in heaven. I want you to know that you don't come into relationship with Jesus by physical association anyway. I mean, there's a chance that this whole pandemic will extend the time of our physical separation beyond what any of us could imagine. We don't, we don't know. We, we're currently developing plans on what our reunification will look like. We're currently working on plans of what it will look like when we all come back together, but Really, you don't come into relationship with Jesus by physical association. It's not by tradition. It's not because you, you do the same things in worship or, or you do some formula for worship that Christians have done before. It's not secured by your upbringing. It doesn't matter if your mom and dad were Christians or if your grandfather was a, was a preacher or something like that. If you feel drawn towards Jesus, you need to recognize that that itself is a move of God's grace in your life. I've always thought that one of the greatest indicators for the existence of God is the fact that every human society known to man has this record of people who hunger for something beyond themselves. C.S. Lewis wrote an essay called The Weight of Glory, and he just talks about that hunger in humanity that, 
that, that proves that, that we are a race of creatures uh, who, who, who need food. Uh, he says, look, because you're hungry doesn't prove that, that there is bread, but it does prove that, that, that you come, from a, you come from, a, from a creature, from a species that actually does uh, eat for sustenance and strength. And the fact that our hearts and our souls hunger for something beyond ourselves is, a, is an indicator. It's a pointer for what C.S. Lewis called the weight of glory. Not by flesh and blood, but by this spiritual connection with God. I urge you, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, to consider the claims of Jesus Maybe you're, maybe you're a believer and, and you, you've been following Jesus for some time. Well, consider what the claims of Jesus actually mean for your life. He did not ask us to agree with him. He asked us to follow him. He didn't ask us to check some boxes and, and say that, that we appreciate this teaching or that teaching. He didn't ask us just for an amen. He asked us to reorient our lives around who he is and what he claims and what he calls us to do. When we receive Jesus for who he really is, he, he means to advance his kingdom and his mission through us and in us. That's why he turns to Peter in verse 18 and he says, on this rock, of course, Peter means rock. He's, he's given Peter this amazing nickname. Peter was rocky long before Sylvester Stallone ever hit the silver screen. And he says, you're the, you're rocky. You're, you're the, I'm going to build, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Now you probably should know that that verse, Matthew 16, 18 is a really, really controversial passage. There are lots of people throughout history that have been arguing over what Jesus really, really meant. Uh, I mean, the Catholics argue that Jesus was talking about Peter himself, and that's the basis for the apostolic succession of the papacy. Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to build my church on you, and, and you're the first pope, and then all the popes are going to be directly connected to you, Peter. Others argue that, no, 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 that's not what Jesus was doing, but Jesus is just referring to Peter's confession of faith, not to Peter himself. Others argue that Jesus was referring, referring to his own teaching or to his own identity. And I, I think there are kind of elements of truth in all of those different approaches. You see, Jesus himself is the church's one foundation. He is the head. He is the leader of the church. We seek to live by his example, and we seek to model our lives on his example. That means we don't just want to agree with him, we want to follow him. We want to become like him, like an apprentice learns a trade from a skilled master. There was a time in European history, uh, and, and even some today, where, where people learn a trade from a skilled craftsman. You might think of, of trades like uh, electricians or plumbers or, or, or other uh, technical trades where they learn how to do their job by working alongside someone who really knows how to do it well. Uh, the better example of that is from, from, from artisans, someone who really is artistic and, and they, maybe they carve these beautiful sculptures and, and they have people who work with them and they learn how to do those carvings by working with the skilled master. In the Middle Ages, the, the apprentice would even live with that master to learn the way of life from the skilled master. Well, discipleship is really about apprenticeship. It's really about living with the master to learn how to live, to learn how to do the crafts and the skills that he wants us to do in our lives. The confession of faith in, in Jesus is the basis for entering the church as well. So, so, so yes, when Jesus says, I will be, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you're the rock, and on, the rock, I'll, on this rock I'll build my church. Jesus is referring to himself, I think, he's, he's, his, himself and his own teaching. I think he's also referring to confessions of faith because we don't get into the church by our good deeds. We don't get into the church by giving an amount of money. We don't get into the church by, by being good or by performing something for God. We, center, we simply enter in by trusting who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But there's something that Protestants, I think, sometimes pass over, and that is Jesus really was talking about Peter too. 
He was talking about building his church on Peter and his flawed, fledgling faith. I love that. Jesus didn't use as the central figure for his, his, his building his church on earth, he didn't use the central figure, some guy who got it all right all the time. Nobody likes that guy. That's the guy we call the goody two-shoes. That's the guy nobody wants to listen to. That's the guy everybody thinks he's better than everybody else. That's not who Jesus chose. Jesus chose a guy who kept putting his foot in his mouth. Jesus chose a guy who kept failing. Jesus chose a guy who was obnoxious and loud and uneducated and not the sharpest tool in the shed and, and, and not somebody who was on an upward slope mobily in the society of his day. And the interesting thing to me is that Peter must have embraced that and owned that because Peter's own recollections inform the Gospel of Mark. We believe that the Gospel of Mark are the direct records of Peter's own reflections. And given his leadership position in the early church, he, you know, he, he, he probably could have uh, just not allowed anybody to say anything bad about him. But I think he wanted all of those things out there because Peter knew of the grace of God. Peter knew of the mercy of God. And Peter knew that Jesus was building a church based on people who had faith, even fledgling and failing and flawed faith. And yet Peter was used mightily by God. It's amazing because we don't have to be spiritual superheroes to be used by God. You don't have to be a spiritual uh, avenger in order for God to really use you. That teacher who struggles every week to make ends meet and wonders how she's going to make it from week to week. But she comes to teach second graders about Jesus. Upon that rock, Jesus builds his church. Those senior citizens who volunteer at the homeless shelter are the food pantry. Upon that rock, Jesus builds his church. The couple who agrees to keep the nursery so that, so that younger believers who are, who are just learning about Christ can come and worship together and deepen their roots of faith upon that rock. Jesus builds his church. That small group leader who opens his home so people can gather for Christian community. Upon that rock, Jesus builds his church. That person who goes out of her way, not just to tell people about Jesus, but to listen to people for Jesus. Upon that rock. Jesus builds his church. Not Avenger superhero faith, but flailing, fledgling, flawed faith. And so God would use Peter to do something beyond Peter's own imagination because faith in who Jesus really is in that moment of encounter with him makes all the difference in our lives. My hope for you is that in the midst of all of this, God will lead you to a faraway place. That God will call you to your own Caesarea Philippi. That he'll call you away from the busyness. That he'll call you away from the centers of population. That he'll call you away from the religious observance. That he'll call you away from the hierarchy. That he'll even call you away from the temple and get you alone in relationship with him and get in your face and you in his and he say to you, who do you say that I am? And when he does that, I don't think he's asking you just for a creed. I don't think he's asking you just for some set of beliefs that you adhere to or that you live your life by. I think he's asking you for, uh, I think that he's asking you for the way that you live. I think he's asking you for apprenticeship. The wonderful thing about all of that is that Jesus promises that when we have that kind of moment of encounter and faith with him, that serving him then isn't this, this drudgery. It isn't this, this worry and this anxiety about, well, about what's going to happen and how we're going to face the next thing. Listen, I got to confess to you, I, I'm concerned about 
our nation. I'm concerned about our economy. I'm concerned about what that means for all of the people who are part of our church family. I'm concerned about what it means for the institution of the church and the finances of the church and all of those things. But I know this. I know that whatever happened, we serve a God who is in control. We serve a Father who is wealthy beyond our wildest imagination. We serve a God who owns every resource. We serve of God for whom nothing is impossible. So I'm not worried about the future of the church. I'm not worried about how all of this is going to play out because I know we serve a God who actually controls history itself and has the power to re-articulate letters, has the power to move streams, to move mountains, to split the sea, to do what needs to be done to advance his kingdom and his purpose. Jesus says, I will build my church. It doesn't depend on my preaching. It doesn't depend on our gathering. It doesn't depend on the beauty of our building. It doesn't depend on the talent of our worship leader. It doesn't depend on the place where we gather or our ability to come into the same room. It depends on the invincible promise given to us by the Son of the living God who said, I will build my church. It's His church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's His church. And He promises to build it. When Jesus uses that term church, the original word church is not a place. It's not a building. It's, it's from the Greek word ekklesia, which means called out ones. People who have been called out of something into something else. Called out ones. It refers to an assembly. It's not talking about a building, not talking about a place, not talking about a set of programs, not talking about a performance, not talking about stained glass or a guitar or a pulpit or a communion wafer or a religious elite. It's talking about a people who have been called out of darkness into his light. It's talking about a calling out of people who were mired in the muck and clay of their lives and their own self-destruction, who've been, who've been called out of that life, who've been set up upon a rock. It's people who were enslaved to the things in their lives that were destroying them, who've been called out of that slavery and called into a place of being sons and daughters of the King of Kings, a community of people who've been called out. Peter would go on in his letter to describe the church like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Every word in that verse is so full of meaning and power. I encourage you to spend time thinking about every word there. He says, you are a, a chosen race. In other words, God saw you. He chose you. He picked you for the team, even if nobody else would. Even if your mom and dad didn't want you, Jesus wants you. God wants a relationship with you. Even if no one in this life, no one on planet earth has shown you kindness, Jesus wants you. He has chosen you. He calls out to you and he beckons you into relationship with himself. You are chosen by God. You are wanted and loved by him. And he says you're a chosen race. I love the fact that he uses race. Because this term is so loaded in our time, isn't it? There's so much pain and so much division that's associated with this idea of race in our world. And, 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 and our society kind of pits this, this endless cycle of arguments about entitlements and about mistreatments and, and, and about injustice. And it just kind of goes around and around and around. And one group feels injustice and another group feels entitled and another group feels uh, uh, disservice and another group feels ostracized. And it just goes round and round and round. And the same discussion goes on and on and on. But Jesus says, I, he, Jesus came to create a new race. Not a people who are born into a certain bloodline or with a particular DNA or a given skin pigmentation, but a race of people related to one another spiritually. That means that our connections to the church, our connections to one another, trump our connections to our nation, trump our connections to whatever race 
we're born a part of. Before I'm American, before I'm Caucasian, before I'm North Carolinian, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, and I'm born of his heavenly lineage. That's the very next word talks about that. He says, you're royal. He says, you, you're, roy, you're a royal priesthood. You are royal. You and I are called sons and daughters of God. We're heirs to the promised inheritance of the kingdom of God itself. I'll have to unpack that at another time. But we are sons and daughters adopted into the royal bloodline of God himself. We're, we're, we're called royals. And he says, you're a priesthood. Now, because Jesus once and for all fulfilled the role of the priest, we no longer require a human to mediate our connection with God. You, you don't need another person to get you to God, right? You can call out to Jesus where you are. You can have a relationship with God where you are. You don't need to go to a priest in order to get to God. But the Bible does teach that we are a nation, a kingdom, a race of priests, we're a family of priests, all of us. Every single one of us is a priest under the Lord. What does it mean then that we're priests of God? Number one, it means we all have the privilege of direct access to God. See, in the Old Testament, only the priests could come close to where God really was in the temple. Only the priests could enter into his service. Only the priests could come into his presence. And then only one special priest could go into the most holy place, into the direct presence of God. But because of what Jesus has done according to the scripture, we can enter boldly into the throne room of grace. We don't need another human to mediate our way to God. We can go to God ourselves. We have the privilege of going right into the presence of the Lord, wherever you are, whoever you are, without any human mediation, God can call you right into his presence. And so one of the things it means that we're priests is that we have the privilege of going into God's presence. The second thing it means is that we still do offer sacrifices. Now, now don't, don't get it wrong here. Our sacrifices don't cover anybody's sin, but we do still offer sacrifices. If you don't believe me, take a look at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 to 16. Through him then, that is Jesus, let us, let us, talking to the church, let us continually offer up a sacrifice. But, but pay attention, it's not a sacrifice that covers anybody's sin. It's not a sacrifice that gets anybody into heaven. It's not a sacrifice that earns God's favor. It's not a sacrifice that gets you eternal life. It's a sacrifice, Hebrews 13, 15 says, of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. In other words, the more we talk about him, the more we lift him up, the more we praise him, our life bears that fruit of praise. And that is a sacrifice unto the Lord. And then another thing he says that comes from our priesthood, in verse 16, he says, do then, don't neglect to do good and share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So the first thing is the sacrifice of praise, and the second thing is doing good. Jesus said that the world would know we're his disciples by our love for one another, that the world would see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Your good deeds are not meant to get you into heaven. Your good deeds are meant to get somebody else there. <laughs> Your good deeds are meant to show somebody else how good God is. Your good deeds are meant so that somebody else can see the good things that you do. When everybody else is running away, when everybody else is not paying attention, your heart is moved to help the needs of those around you. And because of your love and because of your service and because of your demonstration of the love of Jesus, somebody who today is far from God is going to glorify your Father who is in heaven. Then he says, you're a holy nation. We're called to live as citizens of a place characterized by God's righteousness, not first citizens of Garner or Raleigh or Fuqua Verena or Apex or Wendell or Nightdale or any of the surrounding areas, but citizens of heaven called to live according to a different constitution, a different bill of rights, 
called to live according to a different culture, called to live according to a different ethic, not called to live according to what just the standard mentality of the day is, but called to live like Jesus calls us to live. Then he says, we're God's possession. We're his, we belong to him. Since we're his possession, he determines our destiny. He determines our direction. He says, you're called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You've been redeemed from a previous way of life. If I could, and I could open up the portal right now into everyone's living room or wherever it is that you're watching this stream, if we could start asking everybody for a testimony of what God has done for you, we could go on all day long to hear about the good things that God has done in your life. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been lifted out of some deadly situations. We've been lifted out of poverty, some of us. We've been lifted out of brokenness. We've been lifted out of our past. And the light of Jesus shines in us. And that verse in 1 Peter 2 gives us a purpose. He says that you may proclaim his excellencies. This is in 1 Peter 2, 9. That you may proclaim his excellencies. Our job is to tell others about who Jesus is and what he's done. That speaks to the mission of the church. That speaks to what God is calling us to do. You see, church isn't a place where we just come together and enjoy the amenities of the country club. We gather to worship and to encourage one another so that we can go out and proclaim his excellencies. If you don't know about his excellencies, you don't really know him. If you don't know about his goodness, if you don't know about the sweetness of the presence of the Lord, it is absolutely life-changing. You can have an encounter with him right where you are. You don't need a human mediator to get you there. All you need is to call his name. And when you call him, he will be there with you. He will walk towards you. He will embrace you and he will show you the way. We're called to tell people about the goodness of our Lord and our Savior. That's our mission. It's our mission. It's our purpose. We talked on on this past Wednesday night about how throughout church history, the church has dealt with plagues. Throughout church history, I encourage you to go back and take a look at that teaching from Wednesday night. There are just all these plagues throughout church history. And at many times in church history, the, the pagan society was just dumping the dead people out in the streets. But it was the Christians who went to the dead and dying. And listen, it wasn't that the Christians believed that they wouldn't get sick. The truth is, they went out into those plagues, some horrific plagues, much, much worse than the one we're facing right now. They would go out there, and some of them got sick, and some of them died. But they died with such joy because they knew that to be absent from the body for them was to be present with the Lord. They had such a conviction that Jesus was who he said he was. They did not love their lives even unto the death, and they served their Lord with gladness. And because they died, many, many people came to faith in the Lord. But some of us would rather have our comfort. Some of us would rather have our healing. Some of us would rather have our blessing than to be a blessing or than to fulfill God's purpose or calling in our lives. I'm asking God to use this time to call us to the wire, to call us as a people, to call us as a church, to be people who get on our faces before God and call out to God for our nation and call out to God for our families, but then get off of our knees and go out into our communities and go out to our neighbors and go out to the lives of others and spread the excellencies of the Lord Jesus wherever he would lead us to go. When the church is on that kind of mission, the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now listen, I think the gates of hell can withstand a mamby pansy church. I think the gates of hell can withstand a prayerless church. I think the gates of hell can withstand a, a selfish church. Why? Because that's not really, really the community that he's really talking about. He's talking about a community that confesses who he really is. He's talking about a community that that professes faith and trust in the Son 
of the living God. And when the church is on that kind of mission, the gates of hell just won't prevail. Hell, hell in the first century was another term for Hades. It was a reference to the realm of the dead or the underworld. It was a location for all kinds of sinister and hostile powers, but most of all death. So Jesus was saying not even death could stop this promise. No plague can stop the promise. No pandemic can stop the promise. No virus can stop the promise. No economic downturn can stop the promise. Nothing can stop this invincible promise. And remember that gates are not offensive weapons. They're defensive weapons. Uh, you, you might have been from a violent background. You might have seen a lot of fights in your day. I promise you, you you've, never, you've never seen anybody attack somebody with a gate. A gate is not an offensive weapon. A gate is a defensive weapon. So this phrase of Jesus tells us something we often forget. We often, for, we often think of the church as a fortress and hell is on the offensive and we're just defending against the attacks of hell. Jesus said, Jesus did not say the gates of the church will prevail against hell. He did not say, hold on everybody, because when hell attacks, your gates are going to hold fast and the walls are strong, so get in the fortress and you'll be saved. That's not what he said. He said the gates of hell will not prevail. In other words, you're not on the defense, you're on the offense. We sometimes live under this siege mentality, and it's, it's easy to see how that would be the case now. We're under quarantine. We're under stay-at-home orders. And we live in a culture that's growing more and more hostile towards the gospel. But Jesus envisioned a group of people who would be willing to go with him to charge hell in the name of heaven. And when the church is on that kind of mission, nothing can stop the forward advance of God's purpose in the world. I don't claim to know everything that God is doing right now. That is beyond my ability to know. But I believe God is using this time to shake us, to wake us, so that we become not on the defense, but so that we become the offensive kingdom advance that he intended for us to be in the world. I want you to know I think we're doing some of that right here at the Capitol Church. Even while this entire nation is on lockdown, the Capitol Church food pantry still operates. And hundreds and hundreds of people come through there every month, even thousands, come through every month. And they're being blessed and they're being ministered to and they're being touched. That's an advance of God's kingdom. That's a demonstration of his kingdom reality. This relief fund that I'm talking about, this way that, that God has blessed us. And so we're trying to use these funds that God has given us and these means that God has given us as a way that we can try to bless others. That's, that's a small, tiny way that God's kingdom can advance. The video you saw at the beginning of this service about Pastor Akhedra Khuri in Bethlehem and how his, his church is reaching out to the people there, mostly Arabic people, mostly, mostly Muslim people with the love of Jesus Christ. That's a demonstration of how the, the church is moving forward on offense, not on defense. And I think God is powerful enough and wise enough and strong enough to take this opportunity to redirect us and shake us so he can wake us. The church is the community engaged in the mission of God on earth. Now, there's one more thing I'd like to say today. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I'd just like to encourage you maybe to begin for yourself to explore those claims Explore the claims that Jesus makes about himself. Explore the claims that Jesus makes about his own life. Explore the things the others said about him. Read the Gospel of John or one of the other Gospel writers and just get into that part of Scripture. And I'm telling you, he wants to encounter you there. And I believe as you start to explore those claims for yourself, I believe you'll start to sense in your heart a, a tug, a spiritual tug to open your heart to a whole new reality you haven't considered before. But if you're a believer, and maybe you've already professed those things by faith, I want you to understand that 
God is calling you not just to check some boxes. He's calling you to be on the cutting edge of what he's doing in the world. He's calling you to be on the tip of the spear for his advance into this world with the power of his kingdom. So wherever you are in your spiritual journey right now, would you, be, would you just take another step of faith and would you say, would you, just, would you just open your heart to what Jesus wants to do in your life, who he is, who he claims to be, and what difference that makes for you? I want to pray about that together right where you are. Would you just pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everyone who's listening to the stream. People will be listening who are all over the spiritual map. Some of them are close to you. They've been Christians a long time. Others are maybe just exploring the faith. They don't know what to think about all this. Some have been Christians or they're in and out and they're kind of up and down in their faith. And There's just people all over the spiritual map who listen to something like this. So God, wherever they are in their spiritual journey, I pray you would help them to encounter the Son of the living God. And I pray that that encounter would be transformative in their lives and it would make an eternal difference for them. Right now, may they say, Lord Jesus, help my unbelief. Help me to trust you. Help me to take a step of faith. Help me to explore you further. Whether they're unbelievers or whether they've believed in you for years, help us all together to say, help us to explore you further. And the the call on our lives, the demand you make for us to be apprentices. Lord, we know when we do that, your kingdom will advance in our lives, in this community, and around the world. And we believe that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you took a step of faith toward Jesus, we want to help you. Would you let us know what God just did in your life? We want to help you take the next step of faith. We want to be there for you to walk you into another stage of maturity in your life. We want to help you to do that. May God richly bless you. We love you. We can't wait to see you in person. But until then, we hope you'll continue to engage with us here through the streams, through the different groups that we offer and the different resources that we're offering online. God bless you. We're praying for you and we look forward to seeing you again really soon. Faith on a mission. Wow, what a powerful message. A message of realignment, of refocus to tell us that the church is the community engaged with God's mission in the entire world. And you, yes you, you play a vital role in that very thing. And as we have come out of this message, let's be thinking and reflecting and acting this week on who we can invite to join us in a small group and church online for next time. Let that be with you through the rest of your day and throughout the rest of your week. Let's be on mission. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Ryan and received Christ for the very first time, we are overjoyed for this new decision, the greatest decision that you will ever make in your entire life. And we want to help you in your next steps. We want to help you in this brand new spiritual journey. You can fill out a connection card or you can go to our website at thecapitalchurch.org slash connect and let us know that you gave your life to Jesus Christ. We want to pray with you and to help you in your next steps. And so thank you all so much for being here. Make sure to go ahead and follow us on Facebook and even Instagram at The Capital Church and continue to stay connected with us. If you would like to join our weekly email list, then go ahead and fill out a connection card. Thank you so much for being here and have an awesome and blessed week.